Hey, everybody, and welcome to I Didn't Sign Up For This. I'm your host, Christy Sturm, and you have found episode three. I'm so excited at how this is going. Um, I'm, I just feel really good and positive. Things are moving along. We're on episode three. I'm getting materials set up for, you know, Facebook page and all that kind of stuff. And it's just really exciting to me. I'm working on a website. Um, so that'll that'll be a great place to um, kind of have the foundation of everything can shoot off from there. It's a place to go. You'll be able to hear the podcast there. You'll be able to go through what I'm calling behind the microphone, kind of visual aids, pictures or links or things like that that go with the um, different episodes, maybe shed a little more light or explain things a little better, stuff like that. Right now, you can find there is a Facebook page for the podcast on Facebook and just search for I didn't sign up for this. Or you can, yeah, you can just go to facebook.com slash I-D-S-U-F-T podcast. So the initials for I didn't sign up for this I-D-S-U-F-T podcast, all one word. And that's the Facebook page. Then um, if you search iTunes, uh, Spotify, Stitcher, Google Play, um, SoundCloud, all those places for I didn't sign up for this, they'll come up. It's it's the the teal colored logo that that you've seen. That's the podcast. Anywhere you go, say on Instagram or Twitter, places like that. Our ID is the same everywhere. I D S U F T podcast. Id surfed. Id surfed. Maybe I don't. I just ignore me. Um, if you if you already have a favorite podcast app, which a lot of people do, and it isn't say like iTunes or something like that. I mean, there are so many out there, like you know, Podcast Addict or Beyond Pod or Google Podcasts or you know anything like that. If um, you already have that set up and you've got other podcasts there that you listen to and you subscribe to, what you can do is simply go to that app and go to add podcast or search or whatever and enter in the feed for the podcast, which is, here we go, write this down, HTTPS colon backslash backslash didn't sign up for this. All one word, no I, didn't sign up for this, not I didn't sign up for this, didn't sign up for this dot L-I-B-S-Y-N dot com slash R-S-S. That's the feed. H-T-T-P-S colon backslash backslash didn't sign up for this dot L-I-B-S-Y-N dot com slash rss and you can enter that in i i'm pretty sure on any um, podcast app and they will have it there for you and it will be really 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 easy to listen to what are we talking about today oh wait wait one more thing one more thing one more site business um i'm always looking for if you have feedback Um, comments, questions, things to say, topic ideas. What do you what do you want to hear me or maybe me and other people talk about? Um, And it doesn't have to be about parenting. It can be about other things. That's kind of just how I'm starting this off so that, you know, people know who I am and get an idea of where I came from. And it's kind of the the mission statement. It's all kinds of kind of comes back to who I am and what I do in terms of my kids. So, you know, just go to the the Facebook page or send um, an email to Christy at idsuftpodcast.com. That's that's how you can reach me, idsuftpodcast.com. Christy, C-H-R-I-S-T-Y at idsuftpodcast.com. Boy, that's not a mouthful at all. All right. 
This week, I want you to kind of travel with me in your mind. I'm going to paint a little picture, and I kind of want you to go there with me and picture it as best you can in your mind. Um, if you live where I do, um, I live in the Midwest, and corn and soybean fields are ubiquitous. They are everywhere in the the spring and summer and fall. It's just, it's corn, it's soybeans, maybe hay, but mostly corn and soybeans. And a lot of times they will switch off from year to year. One year it's corn, next year it's soybeans or, you know, whatever. Um, if you live where I do, I'm sure you can picture this very quickly. Imagine a really large farm field that has been planted with soybeans and they are almost fully grown. They're, they're very short, they're green, they're almost bushy, not quite bushy, but, you know, kind of bushy. Usually somewhere in this field, if you're visiting, if you're driving, visiting, who visits? If you're driving past in the summer or fall, you'll see this huge field full of these short, green, bushy looking plants. And then every now and then, they're here and there, you'll see a corn stalk just standing straight and tall, just here and there, like, go, like, like an arm raised in the middle of a field. I see this every year in almost every soybean field I pass. You know, I never really thought much about it other than, dang, that corn is confused. I remember back in the fall of, I think it was 2013, um, I spent a lot of time driving past fields because my husband had had a, an injury where he had broken some ribs and um, broke his ankle and he couldn't drive. So I was driving him to and from school every day. Um, and, you know, we I, I, I take him to school early in the morning and then pick him up in the afternoon. And I found myself drawn to these uh, anomalous fields. <laughs> it felt like an anomaly. They felt weird. Um, I was looking to see which ones had the rogue corn stalks and which ones didn't, and I, I couldn't figure out why it happened. I was talking about it with Steve as we drove, and he shared an amazing perspective with me. I always saw them like kind of silly, like they got lost somewhere, or they forgot what they were supposed to do or something. He completely disagreed. This is what he said. The way I see it, those corn stalks are a lot like Henry. I'm, I'm sorry, what? Think about it. Those seeds aren't messing up. They're not incapable of doing their job. They're doing exactly what they're supposed to do, and they're doing exactly what the other corn seeds did last year. They're just doing it a little slower. It just took them a little extra time to be ready. Now, I'll admit that thought had to swim around in my head a little while because it was not the way I thought. But you know what? He's right. Think of those soybean fields or you know what? I'm going to put up a picture of what this looks like up in the um, uh, on the Facebook page so you can actually see it. You see thousands of soybean plants and they're all doing their soybean thing just like they're supposed to and popping up here and there are corn stalks. Maybe they're from last year's planting and they didn't um, germinate. Maybe a bird dropped them there or a mouse or uh, who knows. They're doing their corn thing and they're doing it just fine. And you only notice them because they look different from the soybeans. But they're right on time for them. To say I was stunned would be putting it mildly. I mean, I literally sat there like a, a, just an idiot for the longest time with my jaw hanging open, catching flies. Because it was it was such a simple analogy, but it was at the same time so powerful to me. Um, it, it totally changed my perspective. I like it because it's a really great visual explanation about what things are like for Henry and others like him. They stand tall, they do their job, they reach their full potential, just like all the people around them, just like their counterparts. Just because they do it later doesn't change what they are. They're people, they're just like all the other people, 
and they reach their potential just like every other person, just maybe a little later. And that's okay because we spend way too much time. I think especially as American parents, we contrast and compare our kids with other kids. Is is that kid walking before my kid? You know, sitting, standing, eating solid food, going to school, reading, writing, whatever, before my kid. Are they doing it first? Is my kid behind? What's wrong with my kid? Why is my kid not doing that yet? We start really doubting and second guessing ourselves and wondering if we've missed something or if we need to go to the doctor or do we need to visit a psychologist. Um, We have this like really weird unseen need to push our kid and get them back, quote unquote, on track, at least in our own minds. And this atmosphere of comparison and competition, I think, really leaves very little room for a kid who's developing differently or more slowly. I think, honestly, it's a really rare parent who can see it and just let sit back and kind of let their kid go at their own pace. Also, for parents of kids who are different, the measuring stick isn't, it isn't even in the same language. We can't compare our kids to the kids around them, neurotypical kids. It's totally ridiculous. You know, great, uh, your little uh, Ashlyn started reading at four. Good for her. But Henry was just getting competent at walking at four, something Ashlyn did three years earlier. So you can't compare those two things. They're like they're like apples and pigeons. They're, but, you know, I think a lot of us still feel that pressure, especially early on when the lag behind the neurotypical peers isn't as great as it is later. I mean, if they're only a year old and they're testing at, say, six months, it doesn't feel like that big of a deal. It's six months. But when they're 15 and they're measuring or testing at four to seven, that's not able to be ignored. And it's really painful, to be honest. This has always been an issue for me at Henry's IEPs. Oh, for those of you who aren't in the system, IEP stands for Individualized Education Plan. And it's when all the teachers and therapists and and people who work with your kid, along with you as the parents, get together and talk about um, the goals that they have set for your kid for that. Usually it's like a year um, or six months for that period of time and how they've come along in accomplishing those goals if they're if it's if it's still a skill that's emerging if they're if they're doing it and if they've mastered it and they're ready to move on so you go over all these things and you see where they are physically physical therapy occupational therapy speech therapy um, cognitively in the classroom behavior wise all these different areas so we talk about how they've met those goals for that past time period and then setting different goals or new goals or revisiting the same goals that they haven't met yet for the next period of time um, to see what they need, they still need to work on and how they need to improve, I guess is the word. Okay, starting, starting at about kindergarten age, Um, These meetings became really, really stressful for me. Um, It's hard. It's really hard and it's really painful to sit there and listen to the professionals tell you how far behind your kid is and how what you thought were simple goals that they would meet in a reasonable amount of time were barely even touched. Um, More than once, I've left that meeting just crying Um, And of course, because I am who I am, I sit through the meeting doing everything in my power to hold the tears back because I'm afraid it will it will color their judgment of me as a mother. Um, But almost always by the time I get to my car, the tears are running down my face. But it's not because of like I feel like a failure or I feel disappointment like, oh, God, why can't he get this? 
it's very simply and it's like I talked about in the first episode we have dreams for our kids we want them to achieve the very best that they can to reach their potential and because we're so conditioned to believe that potential is what they can do like other kids they're inevitably going to fall short they aren't like other kids their bodies are different their minds are different their perspective on the world is different this is something that my husband has to remind me of a lot he really does um, my dreams and hopes for Henry are exactly and only that my dreams my dreams to be sad because Henry isn't meeting my dreams is short-sighted what about Henry's dreams how can, this is what he tells me how can I assume that Henry will feel sad or less than or a failure if he can't do what the world expects him to do maybe that's not happiness for him maybe success and potential for Henry is something I can't even comprehend and I need to stop hoping for my de definition and accept his definition of course, that's a little hard because I don't know what that is. But most of the time he kind of shows me because the things that a lot of the things that we like want him to do or are pushing him to do are absolutely unimportant to him. And he doesn't care. He doesn't care about writing. He doesn't, you know, he just doesn't care. Now, I know my husband's right. It's a, because it's a much better way of looking at things that my way is you're, you're easily defeated. Um, you just are because there's no way that our children can meet the world's view of what success and happiness is. They're just not going to. And that's the fault of the world's view. It's not the fault of our kids. So if I'm constantly hoping that he's going to reach that potential and then I'm disappointed when he doesn't because he can't and he won't and that's not who he is, then I'm going to just be constantly defeated. Uh, simple things like Henry can't read yet or use the toilet. You know, what defines success for Henry is going to be up to Henry and those who love him, of course, those who are there to support him and, and help him reach his full potential. Now, that doesn't mean that I sit back and just let him just be exactly who he is and have no hope or, or goals of him maybe reaching beyond what he wants right now because that would be like with a neurotypical kid saying oh you don't like math oh you know what that's not going to be success for you instead why don't we read comic books because you know you you should have some knowledge of math and even if that in Henry's case is just learning how to count uh, you know and maybe understanding a little bit about what money is and how it works and how to pay for something that's that would be a more achievable goal uh, a success I don't know so yeah some kids are slower than others some kids are slower than others it doesn't mean they aren't able it just means they're wired differently and maybe rather than seeing them as defective or wrong or slow, we should see them as doing exactly what they are supposed to do on their own terms, their own timetable. You know, it's pretty cool. I was, I was thinking again about the soybeans and the soybean fields again when I was driving this year. And I started, you know, I was ruminating on it more, thinking about it in terms of Henry and where are we now four years later from when that analogy was initially presented to me because he started high school this year <laughs> all 52 inches of him all 65 pounds of him 
he um he entered these halls of kids like twice his size and close to I don't know, maybe three or four times his cognitive level. He's probably at a kindergarten level, maybe first grade in some areas. So yeah, all, all the kids are probably two to three times, maybe some of them four times his cognitive age. But he's exactly where he's supposed to be. I mean, how will it help him even grow a little bit if he stays with kids at his level? If he's not in a high school environment, he needs to be pushed a little, challenged a little, and taken out of his comfort zone a little in order to develop more. Not to develop to be something he can't be, but to develop to be the very, the very best Henry he can be. But when I think about it, I, you know, I think how much more is he going to develop? Again, um, just like every... <laughs> other single time I've asked myself that question I have no idea he may stay exactly where he is now at like a six-year-old level he may spend the next four years in high school just working on using the toilet and not kicking his food off the table I don't know maybe he'll accomplish other things god if he could read oh god what a joy that would be he loves books you guys books that's all he wants for presents when when birthdays, Christmas, any time comes, he wants presents and those presents had better be books. And his favorite books are those big workbook things that you can find like at Walmart, Target, whatever. They're like the, you know, preschool, first grade, kindergarten, and it's like all big colorful pictures and it's paperback and it's fat and it's kind of heavy. If he could read one of those books, oh my God, it would be huge. So I guess kind of when I think about it, Henry isn't really like corn. Yeah, he's doing what he's supposed to do at his own rate. He's way slower than his neurotypical peers. Absolutely. But unlike the corn, he's not just a season or two behind. It's more serious than that. It's more like that corn germinated and is taking decades to grow to maturity is not just one year behind. A Henry-shaped corn stalk, shorter and lighter, maybe only with a cob or two, and maybe it takes 10 years to finish growing. But in the grand scheme of things, it's still corn, and Henry is still a person. You know, I won't lie. I worry about him. I do. As we've moved into high school, we've started becoming a little more acquainted with the post high school world for people like Henry. Parents of um, over 18 year olds, uh, over 21 year olds wondering about um, Social Security and Medicaid and group homes versus independent living and all these things that I don't get. I do I, I try to follow along and try to pick things up so that I know what's coming, but I don't understand it. It's complicated and it's almost like they set it up so that you can't understand or you don't understand and therefore you miss out on it. But beyond that, <laughs> when I really think about it, unless... Henry starts suddenly overdriving his cognitive development, there won't be any independent living. That's not going to be what Henry can do. He's probably not going to be able to do a group home. Um, at least not where there isn't almost constant help. He has like zero life skills and he doesn't show any ability to pick them up. He doesn't care and he can't focus long enough to learn anything. I don't even know what options are available for someone like Henry. You know, I mean, of course, he's going to be with us as long as that's possible. But after that, I just sent his information off to a, the local group that helps with this stuff, planning and, and getting services and stuff like that. And we'll get an appointment to go in and get him on, you know, all the lists that he needs to be on and get some information about choices and options. And that will be helpful. And it'll take some of the worry out off my shoulders but just like every other parent out there I I just want him to be happy 
I want him to have a life that brings him joy and fulfillment. And I don't care what shape that takes. Uh, I want him to love. I want him to be loved. And because I know who Henry is and what he brings to the table, I want others to be impacted by his joy and his love and maybe view life a little more colorfully because of his existence. You know, I, I want him to be able to listen to ACDC and Parliament Funkadelic and Heart and Queen. And I want him to visit farms and I want him to dance whenever he wants to. I want him to be allowed to sing if he feels like it and jump up and down when he's excited. I want him to have people who will hold his hand if he's not sure about something. And I want them to help him get past his initial reluctance to try something new. I'm sorry. <laughs> Didn't expect to cry. I want him to march with marching bands and dance to Lady Marmalade. And I want him to play his own version of air guitar, which is awesome. And I want him to tell his awful knock-knock jokes that are thinly veiled attempts to get you to do what he wants. I want him to lie down with cows. I want him to have a dog and to be able to ride in the front seat so he can see everything. I'd love him to have like a miniature horse or a cow and spend afternoons outside just talking to it. I want him to visit zoos and ball pits and jumpy castles and petting zoos. I want him to be fulfilled. I want him to be happy, whatever that means for him. I know, I know. It's a lot to ask from a world that doesn't care much about what people want, but only wants to know what they can do. I don't know how or when or if he'll be able to check that box. Okay, that's what I'm talking about right now. He's small, he's slow, he's not typically gifted, but there's so much there. And I think it's the same for all our kids. They're they're small, they're slower, but there's so much there, and they just have to be allowed to find it, to explore it, and to let that be what they bring to the world. And now, it's time for I Didn't Sign Up For This. This week, I'm doing it a little different. This week, I'm going back into my archives. Um, I, while, I was, while I was preparing what I was going to say for the upfront portion, I was reminded of two incidents that um, I thought were really good examples for I Didn't Sign Up For This. They're about my eldest son, and I'm not even going to say his name, but they're funny. He's 17 now, and he's far past any of these young moments of acting with a purpose and <laughs> not being aware of the consequences. The first one is my favorite. I used to talk about when I first started my blog, and the first two were smaller, I used to joke a lot about um, sentences that never occurred to me would ever come out of my mouth. You don't, things that you find yourself saying that just don't seem to be sentences that should exit anyone's mouth. Like with my daughter, one day at church, we were talking with uh, friends after the service and she was bored. Um, we were out in the foyer to kind of a big open space and there was a big, huge brass chandelier up above. She had her bitty baby doll with her and you know she's trying to play with it and stay occupied with it but just like always grown people talk too much and I didn't notice it at first but when I turned she's tossing her doll like a catapult at the chandelier and she's almost hitting it and just without thinking I just go don't throw the baby at the chandelier I thought that was hysterical at least for a while until I realized that I knew nothing. I am Jon Snow. I knew nothing. This first incident is um, my eldest son at about four years old, maybe five. I'm, I can't remember exactly. But I sh it's one of those, I should have known something was up. 
In our living room, we had a large stone fireplace and it had a long, thick mantle that was basically just like a board, a big, thick board, maybe, I don't know, four to five, maybe six inches thick. It was thick and kind of rough hewn. But I was, um, I was working on something. I was doing something and not paying close attention to him. I hadn't heard anything from him in a while, which was probably my first mistake. Suddenly, I hear him shout from the living room, Mom, the drill is stuck. What the fuck? I I mean, I ran like gangbusters into the living room and I see the cordless drill stuck into the top of the mantle. The drill bit was buried into it and supporting the rest of the drill up in the air. He's gotten it almost all the way in, and the drill now wants nothing to do with reversing or working at all. I don't remember how I got it out. I I think I had to, if I'm remembering correctly, I had to remove the the screwdriver part or the drill, the actual drill, undo the drill bit, and then sit there with pliers until it would turn, and I could start working it out. But that's a sentence you don't ever want to hear. Mom, the drill is stuck. (sighs) Okay, the other story, um, what happened in August of 2005, same kid. He was about three going on four. Back then, I had had a shopping addiction, especially (laughs) to this wonderful perfumery called Black Phoenix Alchemy Lab. They make these amazing perfume oils. A lot of their scents are based on like literature and um, the, the phases of the moon and movies and Yule scents and Shakespeare, all this stuff. It, it's just really cool, really unusual. There's a lot of stuff that's more dark And they're not afraid of like being naughty and decadent. And I I just adore them. I still love them now, but I hardly ever buy anything. Um, But back then, I I did spend way too much on them and tried. I ordered like a lot of the new stuff when it came out. But with every order of a five milliliter bottle, they would send you um, imps of scents to try, which are these, you know, tiny little like trial things. They call them imps. And, you know, there's just enough in there that you can try it for a while and see if you like it. And, you know, so you can collect a bunch of them really quickly. I had so many different kinds, um, sexy, fruity, foody. They have every genre of perfume and food ones and the fruit ones were always my favorite. If I got something that I already had or that didn't agree with me, there's a huge community where you can swap and trade and sell. So I always had them in my little office, which was in which I converted from it was like a big, weird cedar closet in our house that I didn't understand why it was a cedar closet. It was right behind the garage. And we found out later that's where all the mice came in. But I, it was, you know, it was small and kind of narrow. And I just had a my computer set up in there and I could do all my stuff in there. So one afternoon we're at home and I just noticed he smelled weird, odd, not bad. Like, I mean, it wasn't like poo or vomit or, you know, anything unpleasant, but it wasn't really appropriate for a four year old. It just didn't fit. So because I'm lazy, I just kind of shrugged it off. And, you know, I knew something had to have happened. And I knew that when I discovered it, I was going to be really unhappy. But I, I just didn't feel like investigating. So now it's bedtime. And um, as I'm getting him, t- him changed and ready for bed, uh, you know, I'm smelling him again. And then it hits me. It's sexy. It's masculine. It's leathery. Oh, hell. And I ran to my office and I find my imp of Desaad on the floor. Three quarters empty. 
my boy and my office now smell like a leather bar pure unadulterated leather like like walking like in the old days when malls had like wilson's leather stores and you'd walk past and just smell all that leather coming at you it was like that only a little more real and not quite so processed like he was skinning and tanning animals in his room or something worse that i'm not gonna even (laughs) relate here um it was a, a much more private smell It was not something you wanted your four-year-old to smell like, and it was not something you wanted your house to smell like either. But that, that was, that was my boy. You know, he sees something he wanted to get his hands into, and he just got his hands into it, and it didn't really matter what it was. Thank God he didn't have to go to school, because I didn't want to imagine having to explain to the teacher why my son smells like a leather bar and that's the shit i didn't sign up for this week thank you guys so much please um email me christy at idsuftpodcast.com give me some feedback let me know what you think um what you like what you don't like what you want to hear more of topic ideas um, anything really. I'd love to know that you're listening. Um, I'm, I'd love to know if you like it and I'd love to know if you don't like it and tell me why. That would be cool. You guys have a great week and God willing, I'll see you next time. <laughs>